1-800-666-8666. We're talking now with May Mozani, founder and CEO of the Arab Institute for Women's Empowerment, NUSUF. NUSUF is committed to supporting the Kingdom's Vision 2030 objective of increasing women's participation in the workforce and cultivating sustainable economic development. May also had a long career wearing several hats for Saudi Aramco. May, thank you so much for taking the time to join us here today on the 966. Uh, you're very welcome. And I have to say, I have to give you an A plus for your podcast's title. Uh, it definitely resonates with us as Saudis and all the people who lived in my country, or I guess are making calls to it. Uh, that's that's that goes to in, in Lucian's ledger. He came up with that one. It's we're we're very pleased with it too. It's nice and concise. You know, if, again, it's it's one of those things. That if you know, you know. Uh, and uh, so we're pleased to be doing that. Um, May, I just we're just delighted to have you, and I feel very fortunate that you've you've agreed to join us. You're doing some fascinating things. You've done some fascinating things. So. What I'd like to do is sort of just get you started. You, um, you, you. I was, I was chuckling in our communications beforehand, and we were talking, going over some of the questions. You said, "Well, is there enough time?" Because I have a lot to say. So, uh, we'll make time, and we're glad you have a lot to say. But let me start out with with um, your career with Aramco. Uh, you've had almost a 30-year career working with Aramco, including director of public affairs for Aramco Services in Houston, Texas. Senior manage, management positions responsible for regulatory and corporate affairs and public relations. You are also a member, and I know how proud this community is. Uh, of, 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 of you're in a Ramcon. Says as you were born and raised on Aramco's residential compound in Dahran. Uh, as a second generation of Ramcon, would you share with us your journey working with Aramco and and growing up there as well? Yeah. Um, you know, the story of Aramco and its influence on me created some sort of an identity separation as a child. Uh, my father worked in Aramco. He was have head of Aramco TV station. And I don't know if you know this historic piece of information, but it was the second TV station in the Middle East. Uh, yeah. You know who the first one was. I don't. I don't. It's, it's, it, it, it was Iraq TV station, and then Aramco, a company, not a country. And it's <laughs> broadcasting, and its broadcasting hours were from 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. because after that, it's bedtime. And on weekends, <laughs> uh, and on weekends, it, it closes at 10, so you can watch the feature movie. And what kind of uh, what was it, but, what did they yeah, what did they on. play? What, what was their uh, were were they top 40s? Or were they news? Were they sort of everything? Uh, they were everything. They they used to have Arabic uh, movies. They used to have uh, Bonanza. I don't know if you guys are old enough to know that, but there was a, <laughs> a lot of some of the feature films, uh, y things like that. And of course, at four o'clock were the cartoons. That's why we do our homework quick enough to watch it. But I was born in the Aramco Hospital, studied in its schools. Uh, I remember back when it was um, an Arabian American oil company. That's where the acronym comes from. And um, uh, it, it became Saudi in 1988 in what is known today as Saudi Aramco. But going back to um, uh, its schools, I, I studied in its school and it was an expat school that belonged to Aramco. And I remember asking the kids back then who mostly were American, and I would ask them, uh, where are you from? And he would say, Texas. And he would turn back and ask me where I'm from. And I would say, Aramco. <laughs> so in, in my small world, Aramco was a country. It had its own school, it hospital, fire station, mail centers, bowling alley, restaurants, movie theater. So, so it had all of that, and you can understand. But leaving the compound to go and visit my grandmother, she would get very upset with us because she wanted us to speak in Arabic. And, um, and that's where we felt our culture and identity was somewhat impacted among a sea of mostly American kids. And so uh, my father, uh, concerned that our mother tongue was not strong enough, sent uh, my older brothers to boarding school in Lebanon uh, to strengthen their Arabic. And I wasn't able to go because the war uh, broke at that time in Lebanon. So right, I right. stayed behind in our local Arabic school. 
And that's where the real transformation happened for me, uh, of being part of my own real community. Uh, I was injected into a classroom full of Saudi girls who only spoke Arabic, while mine was severely broken. But I, in the beginning, I wasn't accepted, um, but not for long, because girls would come to help. Uh, uh, girls would come for me to help them in uh, doing their English homework. And soon after, we became a clan. And when graduating from high school, it was my best experience ever that kind of shaped where I am today. And I'm still in contact with um, half of my graduating class. Fascinating. And, and from the outside, you sort of don't, don't aware of the identity issues because so the Aramco compound is one of a kind, I think, in, in the history of the world. I mean, in terms of a, of a, a country, you know, the U.S. coming in and and being uh, so integrated and yet separate uh, at the time. And it, it, I don't think I've ever, you know, the, the, when you think about a Saudi who's raised there and, you know, the identity issues that you just discussed, um, it's fascinating. I will say uh, I'm hoping we can get on uh, the, the head of the AmCham USA um, on the 966 to talk about the U.S. business community over there because Ultimately, these these relationships that you made and 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 people who were working in Ramco made, also you know in the defense sector and any other sector, that's the glue of the relationship. Yeah, and, that's true. And and we can't uh, and and you know th th it can't be tended to well enough um, because you know high policy or or external pressures or global crises and that sort of thing. The thing that holds it together are these personal relationships. Absolutely, I totally agree. Um, so, so you you graduated high school uh, from in the Arabic school and with your with your Saudi cohort group and and where'd you go from there? Well, I got a job in Aramco, and um, actually that was my only option. Uh, I know the company very well. Uh, we lived nearby, and it was the best choice uh, back then uh, for a woman. Uh, where options were very limited at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, but working for Aramco was like working for a hundred different companies. There, it's just so huge that moving from one division to another is a whole new learning experience. Well, so that's, that's gold. I mean, so you, your learning curve was straight up. That, has to, be, that has, to, has to be a great way to go about your early employment career. It, it really, it really was. So, but, but, but back, it was a male dominated uh, company, just like any energy industry still is. Mm -hmm. um, there were no women in leadership, except uh, one lady who was in the highest position back then, I think in the 90s. Her name was uh, Naila Musali. She was the general manager of petroleum engineering uh, back then. Um, but, um, but that's how it was. You didn't, I have to say, I didn't aspire, um, for, I didn't aspire for a leadership, uh, job because, because I never thought it was possible. Uh, women and me, uh, among them, um, created, I guess we created our own glass ceiling. Uh, we all had degrees, of course. But we didn't think that uh, we could or should aspire for a leadership role. Fascinating. So I, I am guessing we're going to return to that theme, uh, you know, with your work with NOS. But uh, nonetheless, you, you had a number of, of senior positions. I mean, and, and uh, you also were posted in, uh, with the Ramco Services in Houston, Texas, which is extremely important. Yes, uh, yes office for Aramco and that relationships with the U.S. Yes. How, was, how was your time in Houston? First of all, don't get me wrong, Aramco was a very good company to me and to all the women. It was the employer of choice uh, back then for men and women. But and, and how do you, uh, the experience that I got in Houston was absolutely amazing, just like it was when we got our stretch assignments. But as a woman, um, how do you get the attention, respect, 
in particular as a Saudi woman, how do you get the attention and respect and be taken seriously by your male superiors? It's by me being reserved, results oriented, I didn't smile and needed to always be assertive, which is the female version of aggressive. Uh, but but so, soon afterward, uh, though, you start to get noticed and you become a group leader and do well and you become a supervisor and then a division head, get all these stretch assignments like the one in, in, in the U.S., become a manager, attend executive programs. But who's your crowd? It's always men. And this is where I realize that you're that I'm one of a few women in leadership roles. And, and I guess um, it was later in my career that I realized that throughout that journey, I wasn't being authentic. And um, I started working towards um, regaining that authenticity and who I want to be moving forward. So are you still with Aramco? I left, well, I retired from Aramco. Mabruk, <laughs> that's an um, extraordinary career. So it sounds as if, and I, I, you've done, I want to get to something else that we, I think is quite interesting. There's many things that are quite interesting, but it sounds as if the, the idea for NUS was germinating all along. You talk about, you know, because so, so much of what you're doing now is about mentorship for, for women in the business, in the, business, in the workplace. Um, Absolutely, yeah. But before we get to that, uh, I'm really intrigued by your experience with the G20 because uh, uh, the very first episode of the Ninth Success was a really interesting discussion with Abdullah Hassan, who was the executive director of policy, and, and Sue Sherpa for the G20 summit held in Riyadh in 2020. Um, you were deeply involved with the G20 summit as the gender lead for Saudi Arabia's C20 team, that's civil society. Um, one of the things we talked about with Abdullah was um, how the preparation for this event, a global showcase event, was like, like a master class in, in, in best practices, planning, policy development, and that it had a, a really significant impact on a whole, whole demographic uh, of, of young Saudis. Um, but I'm, I'm getting ahead. What was your experience as gender lead with the C20 team? Um, okay, so Saudi Arabia is the largest economy in the Middle East and is the only Arab country in the G20. Mm. So as a G20 <clears throat> member, Saudi wanted to ensure that the whole Arab world had a voice through them. And this is what we did while I was uh, the gender lead. So um, we wanted to ensure inclusivity in what we did and needed to push policies that impacted all of women, of course, but in particular, the Arab women who didn't have a voice. And we wanted to push uh, policies that um, we wanted to push uh, policies that would uh, for instance, ban child marriages that would ban honor killings, FGM, uh, female gen genital mutilation, infanticide, and more uh, than that have uh, impacted uh, women and children, especially during war. Of course, you know what was happening in Syria. That was all before Ukraine. Uh, so we were able to uh, advocate and bring on board activists and there was approval, of course, among all of the G20 members, uh, especially with the migration of refugees to a lot of European countries, and some of them bringing some of these practices to their countries. So there, there was a unanimous um, support for that, and, and I was excited to be part of that. So it was, it was really a good, a good uh, representation of bringing on board the other Arab countries who are not member of the G20 and have them have that voice. We have, at the time, and uh, we tracked the G20 and all, the, there are eight sub subgroupings, uh, the C20 among them, B20, and 
and a number of other other uh, subgroupings that deal with a variety of issues. It's extraordinary the range, really. Uh, even though it's meant to be sort of a financial summit, it, it, it gets to so many other issues. But we were struck by not only that Saudi Arabia is a unique first to host, um, you know, first time hosting the, the G20, but how uh, the goals that came out of the G20, and the, the G20 is a very collaborative effort. You were working with Japan, who preceded, preceded you, and, and then Italy succeeded you. Uh, Riyadh, that is, um, but how the goals of the G20 um, were very consistent with many of the goals of the Vision 2030. Yeah, yeah, very true, very true. And, and it was a unique circumstance where you had a country who was in the midst of a, you know, a, a economic and social reform uh, to have this platform that, again, they were talking about empowerment and, and um, accessibility uh, and, and, you know, big issues that Saudi Arabia itself is grappling with in the Vision 2030 program. Sure. Um, so let's, let's, let's get to your current, uh, current initiative and, and one that's very exciting. Because in 2019, you founded the Arab Institute for Women's Empower, Empowerment, rather, which is NUS for short, which, as, as you pointed out, is, is half in, uh, in Arabic. Um, and this is a women's executive leadership social enterprise to help Saudi and Arab women develop professionally, lead in the corporate and business world, and make a lasting positive impact for themselves, their community, and the economy. I, I won't go into, uh, I, actually, can you, can you tell us about, it sounds like the motivation started when you were at Aramco, and that's when you, you looked around and you said, there's nobody here that I can, you, you know, nobody here is going to mentor me. Uh, yeah. But, what made you take the leap in 2019? Well, remember when I talked, when I was in Aramco, I talked about me feeling that I wasn't authentic to myself. And that's where I started working towards regaining that authenticity and who I want to be moving forward. And that's where I felt like I was making an, an impact, at least for younger women who have joined Aramco and were looking for female mentors. And so um, leaving, back then leaving Aramco was another identity conflict for me that I had been going through. Um, this is the company that, this is the company that I was born in, grew up in, gone on a college scholarship through, worked for 29 years. So it was really who I am and the only company that I know and I from it, I gained skills, experience, have tools. So how was it possible for me to exit from it and live without it? This is what I was grappling with. And of course, I realized it's possible if you have a purpose. And NOS was my purpose. So Vision 2030 was my inspiration for NOS. And what better way to support Vision 2030 and invest in the future of Saudi female leaders than NOSF? And you're right, NOSF does mean have, and our tagline is investing in half the population. But Vision 2030 um, calls for increasing women's participation in the workforce to 30% by 2030. And just three years ago, women's participation was around 17%. And now we've reached a whopping 33%. And we still have eight years to go till 2030. Uh, and so at this rate, I actually anticipate that women's participation in the workforce will likely be higher than 40%. So in education, Saudi women if, I don't know if you know, but in education, Saudi women are ranked number one in the Arab world. And they're also ranked 10th globally. But yet their unemployment rate is one of the highest, which conflicts with the education component. So it's clear that for me, when I created NOSF, it was clear that there is a social barrier that's getting in the way of women's advancement and their participation in the economy. So for us, NOSF is a social enterprise, and we work on closing that economic gap within women. 
And what sort of, as you brainstorm this, um, what programs are you focused on now? You did this recently an interesting, you just did this very interesting uh, Walk the Talk event in Al Khobar. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that and how that fits into your larger, larger scheme? Sure. Um, Walk the Talk is a mentorship program. When I was in Aramco, I mentored around um, 70 women, uh, young young women, and um, it, it was always in my office. And I realized that there was that formality that I wanted to get out of because it, once you're in a relaxed atmosphere that's very casual, questions will flow and ability to connect is better. So we um, worked on doing a mentorship program called Walk the Talk, where we get to, uh, I identified 25 senior female leaders in, from different sectors and matched them with 25 aspiring uh, women. And the idea was for um, uh, them to have a mentorship hour to talk about the challenges, what um, the, what kind of guidance they um, need, and what kind of what can these senior female leaders offer? Uh, for me, I never had a mentor. I never knew what the word mentor meant. Actually, it was people I admired their work ethics, and I was watching them and try to emulate a lot of their work ethics. But but. To have an actual mentorship, it, it didn't exist. And I didn't want this to happen to the other woman. And of course, mentorship is, is strongly um, advocated for right now in this day and age. And so we wanted to create that path where women are have that opportunity to find a Saudi female executive role model that she can uh, connect with. And we... Uh, because it was our first time, we wanted to uh, release it in um, March on International Women's Day in March 2020. Of course, that's when COVID spread and everything was closed. Last year, 2021, we wanted to do the same thing, but um, our numbers in Saudi were not as good, so we had to close again. Right. And finally, we were <clears throat> able, the inaugural one uh, happened um, just a few uh, weeks ago. A couple of weeks ago, March 8th, and um, it was supposed to be in Kobar, my hometown. That's where I'm from and on the Kurnish. But it, it spread in five different <laughs> cities. And so we were so excited. It went to Al Jouf, it went to Riyadh, uh, Jeddah, Medina, and of course, Kobar. So, so this is something that I dreamed of happening in five or six years, but for it to happen on the inaugural was really uh, a welcoming uh, a welcoming message for everybody. And we hope to be able to expand more than that uh, in uh, long, long after uh, the walk, the talk. So I wasn't aware of that. So it, w it was five cities all on International Women's Day. All on International Women's Day. We were sponsored by Munshaat. It's the small business yeah. semi-government entity. And so they were the ones who ran the operations in the different cities. I was the one using my model uh, in Kobar, and they, they had uh, representatives in each city. But, yeah, I was really impressed um, with, with how successful it went and realized that now we have to make it even bigger next year. It's interesting because you, you you seem to be picking up momentum. You were just recognized by LinkedIn as a, as one of the top ten thought leaders in MENA. You just returned for a very interesting um, conference uh, uh, at the Expo Dubai. What is the response of women? Not not the women who are coming to be mentored, but the women who you're inviting to mentor. It must be a tremendous, they must be very excited about this opportunity. You know, I feel that you you have to gain trust in order to approach anybody. And so I feel that I've established that kind of connection with uh, senior women in different in different sectors. And so once that trust and uh, that relationship is strong, they they will certainly trust 
um, that that um, it, you're you're doing the right thing. And with the success of Walk the Talk, you've even gotten a larger circle of uh, women who want to be part of that because it was successful. So yeah, um, you know, I, I, I we talk about NOS as we want to invest in half the population as a Saudi woman in my country. But really, what we want to do is open chapters in the GCC, the Gulf nations, and we want to go to the MENA region because women challenges in the Arab world are very similar. And once we tackle them together, we're able to all as a community thrive. We're reverting to Vision 2030, and, and I think one of the there's some significant progress is being made with regard to uh, women empowerment in, in the workplace. And I know uh, the laws are now in place for equality in the workplace for women. Um, Lucian did an interesting piece last week uh, that talked about the increased participation of women in the workplace and how things like Wusul enabled you know, women who are who don't have enough money, perhaps, to buy their own car to get to work. But you know, uh, Wusul working with Uber and other taxi uh, taxi schemes, you know, enabling women to get to work. Uh, things like this personal status law that is going to come into uh, into play. Now, this is not workplace. This is perhaps more important. It's in the home. So, so many things. But uh, the question I'm at, get, trying to get at is. <clears throat> It looks like Saudi Arabia and, and, and the government is trying to put in place a more equitable workplace situation. What you're getting at is how women view themselves in that workplace. Yeah, yeah. But I, I, you talked about Wasul, and I want to uh, mention how effective this program was. Uh, when, women, the, when women started driving, the increase in women's um, uh, jobs increased by 180 wow. percent. Uh, their inability to go to work was one of the issues that prevented them from getting jobs, which meant that uh, women's unemployment weight, uh, rate was very, very high. And this was soon a program minimized that gap. So it's, it's amazing how such a simple program made a huge effect. But um, as a, a social enterprise, NUS works on closing that economic gap within women. And, and closing that gap, just closing that gap, would add $400 billion to the country's GDP. And that would be equivalent to, to almost $17,000 for every Saudi man, woman, and child. So, so the, the 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 implications are huge to incorporate women within the society. We've talked about how they are the num rank number one as the most educated woman in the Arab region and number ten globally. They're also uh, they they um, they they're in in the STEM fields. They surpass the women in Saudi Arabia. The women surpass the women in Silicon Valley. So so. We need these brains, these minds. We need to connect them to the right jobs, and we need to break our own glass ceilings. Remember, I told you I had my own glass ceiling. We need to break that, and and we and that's what we've done. Based our our pillars for NOS, our model was based on three pillars: equip, which is the training arm, and that provides the training to women at the entry level of female employees who just graduated and just started jobs uh, through providing them with soft skills leadership training. Now you're asking why am I just focusing on women and soft skills training? It's because women as young girls didn't, ha didn't have soft skills um, training in life because for instance boys would go with their father to the shop he owned. And he learns these soft skills every day, or he goes with his father to the office. Girls didn't have that opportunity. Plus, we were um, raised to be um, reserved, soft-spoken, um, we shouldn't be negotiating. 
And my feeling or my belief is that these values that were instilled in us um, don't contradict the soft skills when they teach you assertiveness, when they teach you uh, uh, personal branding, when they teach you all these things. And I'm here to tell them that they complement them. And that's why we needed to in, um, instill these in women. Now, a lot of these uh, Saudi women, like I said, they have um, all these degrees and a lot of them are technical degrees, but they don't have soft skills. And believe it or not, once you combine soft skills with a technical degree, that's, that's igniting them to go up that corporate leadership ladder. And, and, and so again, we, we teach uh, entry level soft skills and then we teach manager level and we, we train global executive program. And uh, of course we have collaboration with global institutions on that. And are the, at the moment, are these uh, initiatives mostly virtual? I know um, they're, they're face to face. See, our, our programs are not open the page on chapter so-and-so and read this. Our, our training is based on our training is based on case studies where we talk about our own experiences and the challenges and how do we navigate through it and how do we adjust to it. In my view, that's the best kind of learning is sharing stories. And that's why we're, um, when we're, we're doing the soft skills with the women, we've identified 18 um, Saudi female uh, trainers uh, why we wanted them female is because we wanted the young ladies to connect with them. And when they do connect and can relate, they can talk about their stories. That's where the learning happens. The books, they can take them home and read them. But the experiences are priceless. And that's what needs to take place in, 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 um, in a, a classroom session. Because women here in Saudi Arabia, and, and I don't know where else, but we don't have a community of professional women. Uh, women go to work uh, in the daytime, and then after that, they go to work again to take care of the children, um, to help them with their homework, take care of uh, their uh, aging parents, do a lot of that. So they don't have time to do the other stuff. And they feel... Um, that they're missing out on a lot. So we want to be able to create that kind of community during office hours. You mentioned international partners. Yeah. And, 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 and what sort of international partners? So, so um, academic institutions. Uh, we are um, communicating with uh, Harvard, uh, NCAT, Imperial College, and Tuck at Dartmouth. Hmm. They're the ones who are handling um, uh, the executive program and the manager uh, program. Uh, but I have to say the manager program has not started yet because of COVID and it requires travel and the travel issue was uh, impacted globally. And so yes. we continued only with the entry level because they're all local and, and that's going very, very well. Of course, when we had lockdown, we did move to online, but nothing beats face-to-face. -face. May, it seems like a huge value add here is the networking angle um, and connecting these um, young future leaders, um, young female future leaders. Can you talk a little bit about that and the, the value that sort of adds um, here? Yeah, it's, it's huge, I have to tell you, because, um, you know, us Saudis, we have our own communities. We have our family community. Uh, we have our social community. But having uh, a business community, uh, a professional community, uh, was really inspiring to these young women, at least the, the, the graduates of that program. Um, and so they wanted to continue to, they wanted to continue to stay connected. And that's why when we bring to our workshop um, uh, uh, participants, we want to ensure that they come from different sectors so uh, they can enrich the conversation. They can talk about different perspectives. 
uh, and different uh, understandings of the business and that everybody learns. What happens right now is a company calls me and say, they tell us, hey, we have 15 uh, employees that we would like them to enroll in your program. Um, I would love to say no, um, but maybe in the future I can. But the ideal situation is for us to have maybe five from the energy sector, five from the medical field, five from the um, uh, academic or from the uh, finance sector. This is where that kind of enrichment happens. And uh, and what we've noticed is that they we have a WhatsApp group for every cohort. And now they've decided to get together every couple of months to go over their learnings and talk about challenges and be it like that kind of support system. We didn't have that before and it's important that we do that, especially from diverse um, sets of uh, backgrounds and and um, and uh, disciplines. What where do you see this going? Uh, how you're how large do you see this becoming? For, uh, for 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 instance, the mentorship program, we see it going globally. Uh, we sorry, we see it go, uh, uh, growing to all of the kingdom. And for um, the uh, community, we also want it to grow as much as possible. So for everyone who enrolls in our program, they come from uh, different regions. We and we're only. Um, a year old in our program because of COVID. So hopefully it will get stronger now that the COVID barriers are removed. So we do hope for it to expand, like I said, all kingdom wide, and then we want to open chapters in the rest of the GCC and all of the Arab world, the MENA region. Right, right. Well, the the challenge is, is universal. I mean, it's here in the US too, you know, women finding mentors. Uh, and, you know, how do you find them? How, how do you, uh, you know, where do you look? And sometimes it's not uh, apparent. So it's, you're filling a, a need, a clear need. Uh, and in the timing, it couldn't be better, obviously, with what, what uh, with Vision 20, 2030, what it's trying to accomplish in terms of women's uh, involvement in the economy. Uh, just an extraordinary effort, May. Um, I have to tell you, Vision 2030, was a game changer for us women. Um, it was like moving to another country. <laughs> the change, the change was seamless. There was no disruption. Everybody is highly educated. Everybody adjusted. Everybody just went into it. And how it could happen. And actually, I have to check the paper every day to see what's changing mm -hmm. uh, in my own country. It's an exciting time to be a Saudi woman. We had a great interview with Lena Almaina, who said almost exactly the same thing verbatim about Vision 2030 and the immediate yeah, I impact. Know Lina. Yeah. Absolutely. She's great. Yeah, the sports she, program that she created is absolutely amazing. It is. The similarities are really striking, as Lucian points out, in terms of how she, you know, that breath of fresh air. They've been trying to build this and, and, and increase uh, female participation in sports, and all of a sudden, there's no headwind anymore. It's all tailwind. It's just mushrooming everywhere in a beautiful way. <laughs> May, could you tell us a little bit about Half Voice, your podcast, um, and if there's space for you guys to grow in the media, maybe to reach um, new young women uh, through the media? Sure. Um, so, so uh, first of all, NUSF um, was built on three pillars. The first pillar is equip, and that's the training arm, and we, we talked about that. And the second pillar is uh, research, and this examines analyzes what's getting in the way of women's advancement and contribution to our country, country's economy, and makes recommendations on how to close that economic gap. But the third and most important pillar, in my view, is the connect pillar. And this is the social component that addresses the social barriers that get in the way of women's advancement. So if you 
if you look at consulting companies, they're experts at organizational design, but they cannot design a society. It has its own identity, culture, beliefs, and social behaviors. Uh, and these are deeply rooted and can only shift with time. And it has to happen within, within the society itself, not from outside. And that's where uh, our Connect program has the, has the uh, podcast called Nos Voices that, that you were referring to. And, and this is where we bring in uh, women together uh, and men to discuss social issues within our society. Women cannot, women cannot advance or thrive uh, in their communities, societies, um, if if there are if if the society or men do not support her, so Connect is a partnership with men and women from within the community, and we want to talk about societal challenges, success stories, setbacks, taboos, and hardship, and we also want to celebrate the male champions who support women. I believe that women um, cannot advance without the support of men. They're the bosses that are gonna promote them, the fathers that are gonna sponsor them, the husbands that are gonna support them, uh, the brothers and sons who are gonna uh, help help her. So, so it, it, as a society together, we have, to, we have to work at it together. It's not us versus them. It's us as a, as a community in order for us to thrive and be, have a strong economy. So Nos Voices is um, supposed to be a monthly leadership, uh, monthly uh, talk that discusses these social issues among us, among our own society, and we talk about that. Um, it's supposed to be launched uh, at the end of uh, March, and uh, we'll let you know once it's out. Uh, can't wait. <laughs> it's in Arabic, exciting. by the way, oh, well. so you, you, you could, yeah. Uh, uh, you could find um, a translator and, and tune in. But you make a good point, and it's something that uh, you 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 can't legislate change. You can change the regulatory framework or the legal framework, but the change has to come about with the social rewiring, and, and that's yeah. what you're that's what you're talking about. And, and you know what? Um, uh, change and policies and um, uh, change and bills that are created maybe in the U.S. and the rest of the Western world comes from the grassroots and goes up to implement uh, policies or regulations. In Arab countries, or at least in Saudi Arabia, it's the opposite. Mm -hmm. the, the pyramid is uh, upside down, where policies and changes come from above to bring it down to us, we never asked, we, we, all our lives, this is how our society has been. But to come and bring on these, these um, changes and opportunities is absolutely a great opportunity for us. And of course, merge that with um, the investment that the country has in the education sector. We have the scholarship program uh, where almost 50% of them are women all over the world. This is the uh, second largest scholarship uh, education program in the world. We're only second to China. So, so when you have all these educated young uh, uh, Saudis, uh, you have to have that landscape where they will all contribute. This has been one of the most uh cataclysmic things for a country to do. This initially King Abdullah scholarship, now the, the uh, uh, custodianship, the Two Holy Mosques scholarship, uh, has just been an extraordinary initiative. And, and mm -hmm. it has, has, we always have talked about this for, we've talked about this for close to a decade, I think, how important it is and how subtle it is in terms of fundamental social change. Because it's, uh, it's not only about academics. Correct. It's about culture. Exactly. And, and it's also, you know, from a U.S. perspective, 
uh, we laugh, you know, because, all right, it's an educational initiative, but it's, it's so much more than that. It's a commercial initiative. I mean, you know, Saudi students are going to come and, and, and have affinity groups and be interested in the same things. But uh, it's just been an extraordinary um, project that has uh, untold returns. I mean, I think of the GI Bill in the U.S. <clears throat> after World War II. Uh, that, well, that was transformative. And this, this uh, scholarship program has been transformative for Saudi Arabia. It really has. It really has. Yeah, absolutely. And in both directions as well, for the <clears throat> U.S. and Saudi Arabia. I mean, if you're, you know, we, Richard, we've, we've talked about this before, but, you know, if you if you live in Alabama or somewhere and you've only met one Saudi, it's very, very likely that it is because of this scholarship program. And that just changes minds in both directions. You get the cultural diffusion going in both ways. It, it is really cool. Yeah, yeah, because a lot of Americans haven't uh, haven't been to Saudi Arabia, but or, or haven't maybe had the opportunity to travel. So learning from a Saudi, a different culture, a different language, different foods is is good for everybody. Mm -hmm. We've been talking with May Mozani, founder and CEO of the Arab Institute for Women's Empowerment. And, if, and I apologize for mispronounce, uh, mispronouncing it earlier on. Um, May, thank you so much for taking the time to join us here today on the 966. It really means a lot. And uh, this was a really great conversation. You're welcome. It's a pleasure. May, this has been a privilege. I hope you'll come back. We'll find an opportunity because there'll certainly be an opportunity to, to discuss something that you're working on or is exceptionally important to, to women empowerment in Saudi Arabia. Anytime. Thank you.